This is Next Radio. With Broadcast Bionics. Innovative solutions for creative people. Please welcome Helen Arney. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, hello, I am your pre-lunch treat. I'm very aware that you are only 15 minutes away from lunch and the only thing standing in the way is me. Uh, my name is Helen. I'm a comedian. I'm a geek songstress. I uh, used to work in radio before I did this. Before then, I studied physics. Do we have any scientists in the house? Yeah. <laughs> There's someone from the RI there. That's not a problem. Uh, and if I do that, do we get any more? Any more? Any, just, have you, just anyone who's recently seen an episode of Doctor Who. That's all I want from you, all right? Because if you watch enough Doctor Who, you get a degree. You are aware of that. It is a media studies degree, but it's still part of your science education. So the reason I studied physics at university was because they told me when I applied, they told me that 90% of my year would be male. 90% of my first year of physics. What they didn't tell me was that although the odds are good, the goods are odd. So that gives you a little idea of where we are. Uh, what I do nowadays, uh, I'm doing for you the science bit because I am a science presenter. I do things for Discovery Channel, for Five Live, uh, for BBC Two Coast. This is an example of my incredible, insightful work into the physics of roller coasters. <laughs> followed very shortly by a, uh, a science experiment into what I had for breakfast that morning. Uh, something else I do is I do a live show called Festival of the Spoken Nerd. We promise full frontal nerdity at every show. Uh, and for that, I do science experiments live on stage, like smashing a wine glass with simply the power of the human voice. Uh, the human voice and a massive amplifier from Maplin. That's how we do it. Uh, so what I'm doing for you today is the science bit. What I've done is uh, I spend a lot of my time working with music, with sound and with science and trying to combine them in a meaningful way. Uh, so over the last um, couple of years, I've been collecting together my favorite sounds of science because sometimes science can be wordy, sometimes, sometimes it can be very visual, it can be very difficult to get things across. And sometimes a little bit of sound can really help with that. So for you, just before lunch, as quickly as I can do them, I have my top five sounds of science. Uh, we'll crack straight on with the first one, loud mouths of the animal kingdom. This, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you from the British Library's collection, the beatboxing walrus. This is a walrus. Wait for the hi-hat. Okay, Muppets drum solo. Okay, it gets better. Wait for it. Oh, amazing stuff, right? Genuinely, that is a walrus making all of that sound. Uh, walruses, both male and some female, they have an air sac in their neck, and it's what they inflate before they go to sleep to keep their heads above water because they sleep while they're still swimming in the water. But at the same time, they can also use that air sac uh, in the same way that human beatboxers do, which is to try and get a mate uh, with some success. Uh, so genuinely, they use their air sac to create beatboxing noises which can travel for miles underwater. They literally use their air sacs to attempt to hit the sac with some walrus tails. So uh, that's a, um, there's another animal that's a nailed mouth I wanted to mention, which is the uh, killer whales. Uh, and pilot whales, you might already know that they create these beautiful songs that can be heard from miles around. They use them in quite complex ways to communicate things to each other. What you might not know is that different whales in different parts of the ocean have different regional accents. Yes, it's not just humans and local news presenters that have regional accents. It is also whales. And the reason we know this is because uh, there's been an incredible project online, which is called something called Citizen Science, which means anyone can get involved in this. They get amateur scientists, no science qualifications, I mean you guys are literally perfect for this, uh, to listen to hours and hours of whale song and try and identify patterns between whale songs that they already know that have been made by whales that they already are aware of and have tagged. So you do this, you, uh, you look at a whale song, you listen to it, you try and match it to some whale songs they already know and finding those patterns you can uh, find the different accents and the different whales and where they're from and who they're related to and, and their kind of tribe. So uh, I've got a couple of these uh, to play to you. Here we go. Right. That, one's, that one is saying, oh, I didn't get Kate Bush tickets. Uh, this one here. That's not actually a whale, that's the next band playing on the BBC introducing stage. Uh, and this final one here. Right. 
Now, that whale actually has such a regional accent, it has been shortlisted to present Newsnight. Uh, so we're moving on to uh, how people get hooked on music. Now, I write songs about music. That's part of what I do. I write science songs. I'm always trying to find more scientific ways to make my songs stick in other people's head. What is it about songs that makes you remember the chorus, makes them catchy, makes them hooky, makes you do things like, I just called to say... I literally just wanted you to say that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, and things like if I say, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Picking on the person I know was a teenager in the 90s. Uh, so uh, what I really, really want is to tell you that there is genuinely a science experiment to find out what it is that makes songs uh, catchy. Again, it's another citizen science project. It's actually happening right now. We have until the end of September, Manchester Science Festival are running this, this basically this game online where anyone can play. Uh, it plays you clips of music from the 1930s to the current day. Uh, and by playing these games, you know, guessing where the breaks are, guessing bits of songs where they cut the, uh, the sound out, you're actually giving them enormous amounts of data that will tell them not only what songs are really catchy, what songs uh, are ones that people remember, but also what parts of those songs are the catchiest parts? Uh, so far, about 10,000 people have taken part in this, and they're still looking for as much data as they can get for the end of September before they announce the results of the Manchester Science Festival in October. Uh, the results, I've seen the preliminary results. I cannot reveal... Uh, anything about them, but uh, I can tell you there's some very surprising things. In terms of catchiness, Shakira's hips do lie, uh, and they also did this experiment in, uh, the, uh, in the Netherlands, where they did something with a smaller group of people, but again, European pop music from all over Europe, things that were popular in the Netherlands. Uh, it turns out the most popular catchy song for people of the Netherlands is the Spice Girls Wannabe. Genuinely, that is true. Look, this is science, this is not about taste, this is, this is the fact. Uh, so what I wanted to do is prove to you that you can make a hook out of pretty much anything. Uh, Diana Deutsch, who's a Californian uh, psychology and music researcher, has uh, made these incredible audio files, which I want to use now to prove to you that anything can become a hook. A hook is uh, like a bit of a song that gets repeated loads, and there's a school of thought that if you get something that's sort of uh, got the right ingredients to be a hook and you just repeat it as many times as you can, you will create a hook. And this is a little bit of science to prove that. So just have a listen to this sentence and see if there's anything the extraordinary about it. The sounds that appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Okay. Anything extraordinary about that sentence? Sounded like someone talking. All right. I'm going to repeat a very small section of but that. But they sometimes behave so strangely. They sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. Okay. And we'll now try listening to that original sentence. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Ladies and gentlemen, that is now in your heads forever. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so number three, your brain is easily tricked. This I want you to get involved in as well. Please put your hand up when you think this tone has reached the top, okay? It's a rising tone. Give me, put your hand up when you think it's reached the top. There's no wrong answers. You can change your mind. If you put your hand up, you can take it down again. It's fine. Okay, it's getting really creepy now, right? No one has taken a risk. No one! All right. Uh, so that is genuinely a tone that will never, ever reach the top. That is an audio illusion. That is tricking your brain in a very real way. You weren't just hearing one tone rising. What you were hearing was three tones rising. They were all an octave apart. And as the highest one was getting to the very top, it was fading out 
imperceptibly. And as the lowest one was coming in, it was getting louder and louder. So what you were hearing, if you look at this, uh, there's time over the bottom and there's pitch going up there. What you were hearing was just a little section of this diagram. You were actually hearing three tones at once. And as you move along the time axis there, you can see the top one will fade out and the bottom one will come in. But because it's really hard for the brain to differentiate between different octaves when they're all playing at the same time, you think it's just one note. So. Pretty creepy. Uh, so this has actually been used by quite a lot of people in different media. Uh, the Dark Knight Rises is a film where they used it to create an engine that revved and revved and revved and got higher, but never had to change gear. So it creates this really creepy feeling that something really weird is happening. Uh, it was also used by the Beatles in their song, I Am the Walrus, uh, which is pretty typical because I have heard the Beatles were always trying to get high. So that's a... Uh, my one joke for the end of that section. Uh, so sounds from outer space. Now, uh, I studied physics. I studied astrophysics at university. Sounds from outer space are one of my obsessions. This is my favorite, absolute favorite. It's not particularly showy, but it's my favorite sound from space. Okay. So this sound from space uh, is a radio signal that is coming from... Uh, light years away, and it's uh, in the late 1960s, day, uh, Jocelyn Bell, a young astrophysics researcher, she heard this sound, or she saw it on her readouts from this four-acre telescope that was being pointed at the sky just to see what was there, just to see what was there, and she heard this regular one-second pulse. And it seemed such an extraordinary thing. It didn't seem like something natural. It didn't seem like something chaotic like most of space is. It didn't seem like something that would come from a, a, a something out there in space, something so odd. Uh, so she wrote in her notebook three letters. She wrote LGM. And with this, she meant little green men. It, it genuinely seemed like if something was trying to make contact with us on Earth, they would send a regular signal like this. They would attempt to get in contact with this one second signal, and then you'd know there was something conscious, not chaotic, out there. Now, uh, it turns out the real answer to this sound is much more bizarre. What you're hearing there is a new type of star that had not been discovered until it was first heard by, by Jocelyn Bell, and it's a pulsar. It's a kind of a dead star that actually, unlike our sun, it spins once every second. It's so small, it's so dense, it's so energetic, it spins once every second. And as it spins, it sends out these plumes of radioactive particles, of radiation from either end of the sun. So you can see it on here, spraying out these, these energetic particles towards sometimes Earth, because as it spins, you can tell that the direction of the radiation comes round once a second. So if you were Earth, you would get a blast of this radiation once every second. And that is how they knew that these existed. Now, it's very interesting with Justin Bell. Uh, she was a research student at the time, so her supervisor took all of her results, added them to everyone else's results, and published them under his name and got a Nobel Prize for it which is how it worked at the time. Uh, but she has lived on an even greater legacy because this is an image of her original results. Now, you can see the, the flat parts are silence, and then they've actually put together all the peaks into a row, so you can see that all of these peaks line up, and it looks almost human, it looks almost organic, but no, this is a, a, a dead star, this is a pulsar, this is a, a distant celestial object. Uh, and some of you who are fans of late 1970s Manchester Sound will recognise this, Okay, so this is how Dame Jocelyn Bell has been remembered in history. Uh, through Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures artwork, morose teenagers throughout history and into the future will be wearing Dame Jocelyn Bell's original artwork, uh, should I say science data, uh, at the same time. Now, uh, there's one last thing I want to do before I get to number one. Uh, there is actually a way that you all can hear sounds from space uh, just at home. Uh, what you need to do is find, if you can possibly, an FM radio in your house. Pretty sure you're all over on DAB now, as is the way. But if you can find an FM radio and you can detune it, so it's between stations. I mean, this is exactly the opposite of what any of you are supposed to be doing. But detune an FM radio, uh, and one percent of that noise that you get from a detuned radio, one percent of that noise 
is the remnants of the Big Bang. 13.75 billion years ago, that energy, that is creating 1% of the noise that you hear in a detuned radio. So, and what I've tried to do is I've taken this file and I've, I've cleaned it up. So what I've done is tried to extract that 1%, that, that incredible essence of what it is to be alone in space, to be the only known civilization here on Earth, the, o the only conscious life, the only people who are looking out there. So if you, if you just lean in and... I just want you to hear what that 1%. Thank you very much. Right. Guys, you were all doing it uh, in the late 2000s, so it's my revenge now. Uh, so, all right, one final thing, one final thing I want to do. I write songs about science, so this is my regular, my normal preferred way of combining songs and science. Uh, I've written for you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a love song from the future. Darling, it's our wedding anniversary next week. My gift for you is carefully chosen. It's perfect for the couple who have everything. I'm getting us both cryogenically frozen. So it's you and me and Walt Disney. And we're dancing and singing in the 25th century. We're living the future held together by sutures, ice cubes forming in our brains, industrial antifreeze running through our veins. I found it on a Twitter advert. So I've looked into this quite carefully. And it turns out there's a lot of contradiction at Disney on ice isn't literal and that episode of Doctor Who was fiction so it's you and me but no Walt Disney just a baseball players and 70s hippies don't shake their hands because you get more than you planned and please stop flirting with your great 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 let me get this right great 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 granddaughter's friends I just want to please I just want to freeze you But you don't seem too overjoyed, my love But it's too late to get a refund And the truth is that I never liked your body much So I have only paid to get your head done Don't have a seizure It's just a so it's you and me in the 35th century I'll keep your brain in a mechanical jar on wheels First cryonic, then bionic And we will be together Though our skin will be like leather But at least we'll be together again Darling, don't complain It's just liquid nitrogen some people say I've got more money than sense. Truth is that I have neither. I bought a package from some cut price cowboys in Russia who didn't build a door for your freezer. You were so lovely. Now your brain is slush puppy. So it's just me at minus 200 degrees. I'm waiting for the 40th century. I have no regrets, except not wearing a vest. And maybe I should just have bought you that discount home cremation kit instead. Ooh. Ooh. Thank you very much. Wow. Enjoy the rest of the festival. I'm off to the British Science Festival. Helen Arney. Helen Arney. This is Next Radio. Was broadcast by Onyx. Innovative solutions for creative people.